Good morning, Unity. So, I love the fall. I love the fall season. And, um, but I grew up in California, as most of you know. And several weeks ago, a friend of mine from California messaged me and said, wow, what is fall like in Kansas City? Don't you love all the fall colors? And I said, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I love seeing royal blue everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so this was an absolutely phenomenal week here in Kansas City, yes? <laughs> But, like in every week, you've got your good news, in this case, very good news, but you've also got your not-so-good news. Some of us might call it even bad news. Not all of us, but most of us, and definitely me. And so, I'm actually going to begin with the bad news, so we can get it over with. So the bad news is that baseball season is officially over. I know, I feel ya. But the thing is, here at Unity, we want you to know that if you are going through baseball withdrawal, there is help. <laughs> there are prayer chaplains and ministers here to support you, and actually on Monday at exactly 7.07 .07 p.m., I will start a support group. We'll go and we'll watch all those, our favorite replays together, and we'll trade baseball cards, and we'll share our favorite pictures of Eric Hosmer. <laughs> we might even put our hands together in a sacred chant and go, let's go Royals, <laughs> right? <laughs> so yes, the bad news of this week is that baseball season is officially over for now. But the good news, the phenomenal news, the fantastic, incredible, but as we reflect on it, not so incredible after all news, is that we can all go to bed before midnight. <laughs> yeah, right? Thank God, hallelujah. <laughs> so seriously, of course, if you've been out of town, you might not have heard, so I do want to announce the amazing news about what has happened in Kansas City this week, which is that the Kansas City Royals won the 2015 World Series Championship. Yeah? Amazing! This is amazing! It's historic! But not only that, 800,000 people, 800,000 people, like double the population of Kansas City, came out to celebrate in the parade. So even if you don't like baseball, that idea of diverse community coming together without rioting is absolutely amazing. Amazing. So, my friend from California <laughs> called me. This is actually last year. And she was pleasantly, su pleasantly surprised. This wasn't like a little jab or anything, but she's like, Nian, you know, she watched me posting things about the World Series on Facebook. And she's like, Nian, I didn't know you were a baseball fan. And I said, I'm not. I'm a Royals baseball fan. It's a totally different thing to me. I'm a Royals fan. And what that meant to me, what I came to love about watching this particular group of people come together is not so much, of course, that they won, because as you saw, they sometimes won and they sometimes lost, right? But what I saw that was so beautiful was that they have this winning spirit, this winning spirit, 
such that um, when interviewed this year, many of the guys said, oh my God, last year when we lost, we were incredulous. We were so surprised because we really thought we were going to win. We just didn't realize it would be next year, right? But they had this winning spirit. And so I want to talk today about this, about what it means to have this winning spirit. Because frankly, I used to actually be kind of opposed to spectator sports. And I think my issue with them was always the idea that sometimes through them, we disown our own power because we assign that power to someone else. We allow other people to be those heroes and those champions. And we identify them, feel that high for a while, but then go back to our lives and don't feel any responsibility for applying those same winning principles to our everyday lives. So today, I want to talk about what happens postseason. What happens when baseball is over, but we have to get up each day of our lives and take a look at ourselves in our lives, take a look into our hearts, and tap into our own dreams, and really ask ourselves, are we having this winning attitude? Are we bringing this winning spirit into our own lives? And so what is a winning spirit? Of course, for me, as I reflect on it, there are tons of characteristics that I would list for those I feel have this winning spirit. But today, I want to focus on just three that I feel are key. And they are this. First, there's this uh, saying, it's an anonymous saying, that's essentially the difference between a winner and a whiner is the sound of the eye. So what does your eye sound like? When you speak about yourself, what do you sound like? When you speak, what do you sound like? A winner or a whiner. And then second, I want to put out the idea that comes from baseball, which is that errors are part of the game. That failure, that making mistakes is just part of the game. And then finally, I want to put out the idea that a winning spirit is a spirit that is not only relentless, but royally relentless. So these three points. So first, first, how do, we, how do we know if we're being more like a whiner than a winner, if that I sounds kind of whiny? Well, one of the criteria that I use is I take a look at whether I'm focused on the past, even the recent past, like what someone just did, or just did to me, or whether I'm focused on the present and the future. You could imagine um, in the final game of the World Series, when the Royals were down, what, what was it, like 0 to 0, right? I mean, 0 to 2, sorry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> 0 to 2. Error. <laughs> so, <laughs> all part of being human. <laughs> so, um, that, I mean, they could have been like, oh, geez, how on earth did we let that Constantino, Consento, whatever his name is, get those home runs? You know? How on earth did we let that happen? You know? Maybe we should have had a different pitcher to start with. You know, if they were focused on that, they couldn't have focused in the present moment, so they could focus on you know, what's here for the present moment. Keep the line moving. In the present moment, bat and keep the line moving. What are we looking for for the future? Win the World Series, and they did. And the ninth inning, by the ninth inning, they were at zero, and they ended winning seven to two. That is incredible, right? You can't do that if you're sitting there going, second-guessing the past, even the very recent past. So the difference between a winner and a whiner. Another difference between winners and whiners, um, and I want to say when I talk about winners and whiners, I want to talk about winners and whiners in each of us, right? I'm really talking about myself. The whiner in me. <laughs> when I'm acting like a whiner, then I'm actually focused on assigning blame rather than taking personal responsibility. You know, I'm focused on the fact that, oh my God, it's because, you know, Hosmer made that mistake. 
Could you imagine if Salvi's like, Hosmer just made that mistake. I'm not going to play anymore. <laughs> right? I, I don't even feel like it anymore. No, we take responsibility, we do our part, take that next step. You know, um, and I say this, um, well, well, let me go back a step. So, taking responsibility. Um, I want to move on actually here to the second point, because this is the point that I really want to dwell a little bit more on. So the, second, so the first is don't be a whiner, be a winner. The second is, funny, because I'm feeling like I'm making a mistake right now. The second is recognize that errors are part of the game. And I guess um, I'm starting to get a little bit emotional about this because this is really dear to my heart. Um, I grew up in a family where I really didn't feel like you can make a mistake. You know, and in our family, an A minus was a mistake. So there's a lot of shame around like doing anything even remotely wrong. I don't know if you saw Sandra fiddling with me back there, but I'm like, I had this panic moment. Did I turn on my mic? What if I didn't turn on my mic? You know, and, and, and just this, this idea of like doing anything wrong. And so in baseball, we can learn from this idea that in baseball, it's integral to the game. It's considered like a, an essential part of the game that we err. And I thought, God, you know, it'd be a lot nicer in the world if we really saw that as applicable to all of life. I mean, we all recognize that we do this, right? How many of us have erred this week? Right? How many of us have blundered in a job interview? How many of us have relapsed in our addiction? in our recovery? How many of us have gone back to that ex that we said we're never going to go back to? Right? We make these mistakes, and other people make mistakes. Right? Like our boss makes a bad call that we think is unfair when it comes to another coworker. Right? Our partner forgets to pick up the kids because she's watching the game. <laughs> we all make mistakes. It's part of life. And as I'm telling you this, I'm very much telling that to myself too. Because I can tell you that when I was watching the game, I think it was game two, and the guys, I don't remember his first name was like Raul, but I remember that he's a Royals player, and they announced that this is like his first time at bat. In, um, like in the world, well, so his first time at bat in the major leagues. Right, someone's nodding, thank God, okay. And he starts in the World Series. That's his first time. And I remember like during the game, everyone's loud and boisterous, but I was like super focused on this guy. And I realized how much I identified with this guy and the pressure that he must have been under. He gets up. Bats, strike one. He gets up, bats, strike two. He gets up and he bats, strike three. That was it, you know? And I remember watching him as he walked back to the dugout. And he, and as he did, I was like, what are the players going to do? And I saw the other players like, hey, high five, giving him looks of encouragement. I'm like, that's awesome. That's awesome. But I was so focused on it because I realized I felt like him when I came to Unity here. I was a rookie. <laughs> you know, I was invited to join the ministerial staff here just in January of this year while I was still a student. You know, and there was a part of me who's like, I'm not ready. Let me finish school. I'm not, I don't feel ready. But it's like when the big leagues call, you know, you say yes, right? <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I'll do it. It's on the job training, <laughs> you know? But I felt like this rookie. And I, and I honest, honestly, I felt like day to day, I'm like, seriously, I'm making another mistake. That's another strike. And that's another strike. And that's how I felt starting out. But you know what? Our T 
team here is as good as the Royals. And I can tell you that the big, the big guns <laughs> back here, when I thought that I had just struck out, I'd go back and our ministerial team would give me a high five, encourage me, right, Duke and Sandra. <laughs> Yeah, it meant the world to me. You know, so for the Royals, winning the World Series was their dream. And for me, Unity Ministry was mine. So you can imagine that pressure that I felt and, and to feel like I was making mistakes left and right. I know that if not for that sense of spaciousness, around that learning process, I would not be able to be here today, you know? Spaciousness, making room for ourselves and others around us to err. So, the final, the final trait that I believe is essential to a winning spirit is this to be relentless, to be royally relentless. You know, um, I got this term because when I Googled, you know, in my withdrawal, I Googled like every article I can find. <laughs> and so if you Google the royals, you actually get headlines. Uh, a lot of the headlines use this adjective, relentless. And I know it applies to the royals in at least two ways. One of them is relentlessness, perseverance during a game, right? So the capacity for even most of their scores to happen, like from the seventh or sixth inning and on, that's phenomenal. Relentlessness to make sure that they win the game. But also like a relentlessness in their faith to know that what they in their hearts felt was theirs, which was the crown, was not going to be taken away from them. That inevitably it would be theirs. And again, I noted that, their interview, that in their interviews, they really talked about how they knew this. They knew this coming in to the game that they would win. And I know oftentimes you know, especially, you know, we're talking about a team of like 20 year old guys, you know, people be like, well, they're young, they can be relentless, because you know, they're young and strong. But I have a story for you about a woman who is 64, who was 64 years old, when she accomplished what was a lifetime goal for her, to swim from Cuba to Florida. A hundred mile swim. She did this when she was 64, and she did this at a time when nobody else, at whatever age, had ever done this before. And her words, when she shares about it, are so poetic that I want to share her exact words with you here. She says this, and her name, by the way, is Diana Nyad. If you want to look her up, there's a TED talk. So, Imagine, it's the fifth time I stand on this shore, the Cuban shore, looking out at the distant horizon, believing again that I'm going to make it all the way across that vast, dangerous wilderness of an ocean. Not only have I tried four times already, but the greatest swimmers in the world have been trying since 1950, and it's still never been done. And then after she does this, she gives advice to all of us. You have a dream, and you have obstacles in front of you, as we all do. None of us ever get through this life without heartache, without turmoil, and if you believe and you have faith and you can get knocked down and get back up again and you believe in perseverance as a great human quality, eventually you will find your way. If you believe and you have faith 
and you could get knocked down and get back up again, and you believe in perseverance as a great human quality, eventually you will find your way, she says. And she also added, I'm in my prime. <laughs> my thought about this was that if she came to Kansas City, the royals would be asking her for her autograph, you know? <laughs> Amazing woman. Definitely check out her TED Talk. So here's the thing. Here in Unity, we believe that we are actually all winners, that we are champions, that we are all like expressions of an infinite greatness. But not all of us are called to win a World Series. Not all of us have the dream, and in fact, for me, it'd be kind of a nightmare, the idea of swimming in the dark with jellyfish, um, of doing what this woman did, right? For some of us, our big win is getting the kids to school wearing the same socks, pair of socks, right? For some of us, the big win is just getting up in the morning and facing another day when everything in us does not want to. Not all of us are called to public wins, right? Many of us are called to, the, to those private matters that happen in the home, caregiving for a parent. That's our calling, right? But the beauty of public wins is it gives us an opportunity to be reminded and reinforced in the human capacity to fulfill our divine potential. It reminds us to dream the biggest dream we possibly can and to question if I've been thinking that my big goals are these little day-to-day -day matters, am I truly dreaming my biggest dream? Or do I simply fear because, well, you know, I have that mortgage now or I have kids now or I'm older now, that if I were to try to claim that dream, I would just be disappointed. Public wins remind us to claim our biggest dreams. And they also, we also can learn from them, right? With these three points, we can remember as we move forward into our daily lives. We can become conscious of whether we're being the I in whiner or the I in winner. We can remember to hold space, to allow our own mistakes so that we can be more courageous in our efforts, so we can try bigger things that we've never tried before. We can remember to hold space for other people's errors so that we can be the person who's looking for solutions. And then finally, we can remember to be royally relentless because if a dream is truly ours, like we know it in this place that is beyond what anyone can tell us about what our qualities are in the outer world, you know, whether people think we're not fit for that, if it's truly ours, we know it. And we hold that faith and we do it relentlessly. So as we prepare now for a time of meditation, I invite each of you to tap into that place that is the winner, the champion, the spirit, the infinite spirit that resides in you and in each of us. So let's begin.
Slowly exhale. Take another deep breath. Slowly exhale. Breathe into this moment of your aliveness. You are at bat. This is your opportunity to shine, to awaken more fully to that winning spirit that is inside of you, that is the very essence of your being, that is the source of your dreaming. And take another deep breath and go deeper into this, here now, into the silence of your being. And as you bring your attention gently back into the space of this room, I invite you to heed the words of Leonard Cohen in the song that David sang for us in the beginning here. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering, because there's a crack in everything. But that's how the light gets in. So as you bring your attention back into your lives, I invite you to allow that light to flow freely through what you might think are your faults. May the spirit, may the winning spirit that is in each of you flow forth into your lives, into your week, and bless the world. So it is. Amen. This little light of mine, I will let it shine. This little light of mine, I will let it shine. 
This little light of mine, I will let it shine, let it shine.